Hey, let's turn our Bibles, if you got one, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. I know they put them up there, but if you have your own Bible, take a look. If you need a Bible, we want to make sure you get one. Uh, I like to give those outs. If you want one, just, just ask. We'll find you something. It may or may not be brand new. 1 Samuel 16. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad to see everybody here today. It's, uh, I know some folks probably got kind of beat up yesterday, a little tired, but, but you, you're here. You're, you're troopers. You're, st- you're still standing, right? That's a good thing. Yeah. Who I understand is not the prophet Joel, but the prophet John. <laughs> so I got wrong on that. First Samuel chapter 16. I want to talk this morning. This is going to be a little different kind of message than I sometimes do. I want to, I'm calling this message Four Guys and Bruce. Four guys and Bruce. It's not. It's not weird. It's not not going that direction. Just so you know. Four guys and Bruce. <laughs> this is a. This is kind of a life message for us because I want us to think about what's coming next. What's the. What's the next step in our lives? Where Where are we heading? Uh, what's What's our goals? What are we thinking? Some of us think, Hey, God's done with me. He's not. Some of us think, Oh, it's too late for me. It's not. Some of us think God doesn't have a plan for me anymore. He He does. Let's just. We're gonna get with the program. So we're gonna look at it today. I want to start with the idea. Uh, Sometimes we don't think God could use us. And then other times, when we do think he can use us, it takes longer than we thought, and it's harder than we thought, and it's different than we thought. And that's why God wants to raise up people that can stand firm and haven't done everything to stand. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. I, again, I'm kind of getting off track here, but I remember one of the fellows from uh, a large church out in California, Bethel Church, and he talked about, yeah, we have guys that go through our whole ministry program, three years of school, and, and, and they get out, and I meet them on the street, and they're not even walking with God anymore. I think that's a shame. I think that's terrible. When people spend that, you devoted your life, you got, what happened? Did you burn out? Did you quit? Brothers and sisters, don't quit. Never, never, never give up. God's got a plan for you, right? Yeah, okay. Just starting with the first guy. Four guys and Bruce, first guy. The Lord said to Samuel, he was the prophet then, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. Saul was having issues. We'll talk about him in a minute. The Lord said, take a heifer with you, that's a cow, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Now, anointing, they'd put oil on the head, and that was a sign that God was going to do something special with that person. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Because they knew that Saul was a little crazy, and he come, might come after them. <laughs> Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. That was the oldest son. But the Lord said to Samuel, listen to this. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Why don't you say that with me? Man looks. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Try that again. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He knows your insides, doesn't he? Knows you really, really knows you. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. He asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Now, honestly, you know, I got seven sons. I think that's pretty good. You know, when you've gone through all seven and it's still not, is that all you got? (laughs) It's like, wow, I feel like a a loser. (laughs) Are these all the sons you got? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down till he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ready with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Father, I just ask that you open your word to us today. It's not going to be just old history lessons. It's not going to be just old stuff. Lord, let this word just be filled with you, your spirit and your power. Your words are spirit and their life. Lord, come and talk to me today and each one of us today. 
Lord, I pray that you'll give me and every one of us eyes to see and ears to hear, minds that can understand, hearts that will be good soil and receive the word and bring forth a harvest 60, 30, 60, 100 times what we put in there. Lord, I know I can't teach this, I can't preach it, but you can. Jesus, you're the greatest teacher who ever lived. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll step forward and you'll share your word with us by your spirit, and each one of us is going to hear a fresh word from you and know exactly what you got for our next steps in our walk with you. We just want to keep on growing till the day we see you face to face. And all God's people said, amen. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through these guys. There's a whole lot of stuff we could talk about them. But here comes Samuel. He's the, he's the prophet. He's really kind of the last of the Old Testament kind of prophets. In that, in that um, the last of the Old Testament judges, I should say, first of the prophets. And he comes to anoint David. David's now going to be the, the new king. And David doesn't know that yet. And David is the youngest of eight. Tell me, tell me for a second, if you're the youngest and you've got eight, seven older brothers, he's also got sisters, if you're the youngest one, how might you feel about life? What can happen? What happens to us when you're, when you're the very youngest? What's that? You might get put down. Uh, okay, yeah, that could be. Yeah, a lot of things could happen. There's not a wrong answer here. What, what happens when we're the very youngest? You can get overlooked, yeah, because there's already a whole bunch of other. He's got, you know, sisters too. So he might be in a family of, you know, 10 or 12 or 15. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, what else? You might be overlooked. What else? Maybe you thought you're not capable. Sure. I heard, I heard, heard a good one over here. She is the youngest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that can be kind of true, too. There's not a right or wrong answer for that, but in this particular, sometimes the youngest ones get away with everything because, uh, you know, it's too late for them. They do, they do whatever they do. But in this particular case, David is kind of, he's kind of picked on just a little bit. He's the one that's tending the sheep. In fact, he's not even, when Samuel comes to pick the one that God wants, he isn't even invited. Did you ever feel left out of the party? Did you ever feel overlooked, like everybody's picked and invited and you're all allowed to come except for me, right? That's how I would feel that maybe. He's the youngest. You might feel rejected. You might feel like you're not important. You might feel like, uh, like I said, you're not even invited to the party. Uh, that's, well, we can't invite David. He's got to take care of the sheep. <laughs> you know? In fact, if you look at that, when we just read that, they didn't even mention David's name until the very last verse that we read. They didn't even mention him by name. They, oh, they just call him, oh, that is the youngest. There's the runt. He's, he's out there doing stuff. But you know what? The Bible, we just read it. God doesn't look on the outward stuff. God looks on your heart. I want to say this the right way. I've known some people that were very spiritual in the sense that they were hungry for God and wanted to know God, but their lives were a mess. And that goes kind of counter to how a lot we think about it. We think if you're, if you're really spiritual, you have to like look a certain way or act a certain way. The Bible doesn't really teach that. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, you know, right? So, so we have a God that knows you through and through, and you might feel like you messed up. You might feel like your life is over. God is seeing your heart. You got a heart toward God? God says, I can use you. And he brings David in from the, from the field. They had to go get him. Isn't that great? You're, you're so, you, oh, somebody go get David. We can't have any party till David gets here. Him again. You know, he's always the last one. God looks at the heart. You don't even hear his name. And yet God had chosen him. God had a plan for him. God had a destiny for him. And if I said it would be easy, if I said, oh, once God anoints you, once the Holy Spirit comes on you, it's all going to be easy. You've got plenty of people out there that are already saying that. I'm not going to say that because the Bible doesn't say that. I want you to know, sometimes when you're anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, it's challenging. In fact, if I just back up a little bit, this is off the subject, but do you remember the first thing that happened when Jesus was baptized and came up out of the water? The Holy Spirit came down and settled on him like a dove. John the Baptist testified, that's the one, that's the Messiah. What was the first thing that happened to Jesus? He was led into the desert, to the wilderness, to be tempted by Satan. Sometimes the, the, fir the, the first thing that happens when we get the Spirit of God on us is there's trials, there's tests, there's something that, that, that we have to go through. I'm just saying that when you're anointed, it doesn't necessarily make it easy. It doesn't, doesn't mean that all your troubles are over. I was thinking about this. David, is, he has not yet, what, what is probably the most famous thing we know about David? Face Goliath. He still hasn't faced Goliath yet. How do you want to be the anointed one and you still got to face the giant? You haven't done that yet. Um, He's going to be rejected by King Saul, the guy that 
God, as we just read, is already rejected here. He's going to be rejected by King Saul eventually. Saul is going to be jealous. Saul is going to try to kill him. There's a couple times Saul tries to pin him to the wall with his spear. And I got in the margin of my Bible, it says, then David knew that Saul was trying to kill him. And I wrote in my margin of my Bible, that was sharp thinking. <laughs> Finally, you figured it out. I mean, how many times you got to be speared at before you, you know what? I think this guy's got, a, got it in for me here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let's figure some stuff out. It's going to be almost 10 years from the time he's anointed here to when he actually becomes the king of anything. That's a long time, isn't it? Joseph in prison, remember that back in Egypt? It's like 10 years before he finally gets out and finally is able to, uh, to, uh, to we, we always, oh yeah, Joseph, all of a sudden he's, you know, the prime minister of Egypt. It's 10 years or 13 years, whatever. I didn't look at it, so I forget, I'm sorry. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. But so, when you're in prison, it seems like a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, can, can seem like a bit. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be chased. He's going to, I was just thinking he was, he was chased through the wilderness. He's chased around the mountain. His men are with him. They're trying to get around the mountain. Saul's chasing them, almost got him. And, you know, fortunately, the, the message came to Saul, hey, the Philistines are, are looting the, the, the threshing floors of Kyle. You've got to go back. And, oh, it's like Saul's curse is foiled again, like you know, Snidely lit Whiplash, for those of you that are old enough to remember him. You've got to go back and chase them now. So David gets away. But it, it's a long time. And he finally has to live among the Philistines. It's a long time before he finally becomes the king. And he's just king of Judah. And it's another uh, six and a half years till he becomes king over the whole thing. So we're talking over 16 years between the time I've chosen you, I've anointed you, I've called you to be king, to where he finally gets to experience everything God had for him. What's the lesson in there for us? Don't give up, don't quit. You, just because you haven't got your destiny yet doesn't mean it's not still coming, right? It's, 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 there's still more to come. Whatever God says about you is true. Hang in there till it comes to pass. Keep walking with God till you get everything that God's got. Uh, don't want to get weird about it, but sometimes we do with that same stuff. We're hiding also, hiding in the wilderness, hiding from Saul, hiding in the cave, hiding from our past trying to overcome our own giants, right? It's not all, all, all the giants aren't Goliath, you know. Some of the giants are things that we've experienced. Some of the giants are mental, aren't they? Some of the giants can be physical. They can be, they can be sickness. Some of the giants can be stupid mistakes that, that we made. Some of the giants can be shame and fear and rejection, addiction, and again, I'll include in there stupid stuff we did. Those are all giants. What do we do with giants? Come on, talk to me. What do you think you're supposed to do with a giant? Come on, what do we do with a giant? Well, okay, you give it to God, but then what? What did David do with his giant? Yeah, you got to hit it with a rock. You, you, know, whatever, you know what I mean? Don't, don't stop just because it's hard. Let's press through. Let's make this thing work. Just If you tell me it's challenging, I'll say, it probably is. That's true. And you're not the first one. You're not going to be the last one, but you and I can do this thing. God's got a plan for you, and it's not you on your own. The Holy Spirit is going to do that in you. I want everything God's got for me, and I want everything God's got for you. Say with me. I want everything God's got for me. Yeah, and when I say me, I mean you, just you know, so you know. <laughs> okay, so the first guy we're looking at, four guys in Bruce, first guy we're looking at is David. Choose to follow God when you're anointed, when you know God's called you. You may think all of a sudden it's going to be just simple. Don't quit. Never, 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 never give up. You got a plan, but make sure, you know, you can do stuff to make it easier on yourself. Spend time in the Word. Get people around you that'll pray for you. Find, get, find like-minded folks. Come here. Bring people here. You, you, you'll see. It's good. Uh, I, here's the Bruce part. Um, a year ago, Claude and I celebrated 45 years of marriage, and my son Sammy and I had been riding on an airplane, and we both saw a, a movie that was related to this rejected Pakistani kid from London that really was moved by the music of Bruce Springsteen. Only mentioning that because I think that's what put in Sammy's mind, hey, Bruce Springsteen is, was kind of cool. That was kind of fun. You know, I knew him as, when, I was a, when I was a kid. We go back a long way. You know, I'm old. So is he. He's older than me. <laughs> anyway, um, he got, uh, unbeknownst to me, tickets for, my, for Claudia and I for our 45th anniversary, which was a year ago. Bruce got sick. He talked about that. He said, yeah, I, I was so sick, I couldn't get out of the chair, my belly hurt, couldn't pick up my guitar, my belly hurt, couldn't pick up my kid, my belly hurt. I'm glad to be in Philadelphia. And, 
and uh, the, you know the way he does the show and all that. And please don't don't get sidetracked by the music. I don't care if you like Bruce or not. That's not really the point. Uh, and whether you think Pastor should have ever gone to such an ungodly thing, that's not the point either. That's not where I'm going with this thought here. I don't. I just want you to know I was there, and that's how I got there. And thank you, Sammy, for the tickets. That was a lot of fun. Uh, th three of the kids went with us, and that was neat too, just to to experience something like that. But where I'm going with that thought is now that I've given you all the backstory is he talked about his first band. He started as a teenager. He was, he was in one. He was about 15, and it, they were together for a few years, like three years, which is a lot when you're a teenager. That's a long time for a band to stay together. Teenagers don't do anything for three years. They barely go to school three years anymore. <laughs> Just saying. Um, and he, he had come to the point in this past year when the last surviving member of that band had died. And he says, now I'm the last man standing. I'm the, last one, I'm the last one of that left. I liked what he said. He said, but you know what? I'm not quitting. I love what I'm doing. I love playing music. This is not a farewell tour. I'm not going to do a farewell tour. I want to keep on doing what I'm doing. He says, I'm here. We're down in Citizens Bank Park. He says, we've got 20,000 people saying, Bruce, you know my name. How cool is that? You know? Now, understand this. Some of his songs kind of reflected that because he talked about the idea of, he says, I've really had to, he talked to us about it, I really had to deal with my own mortality. Something about facing death when you're the last one of your group, when you're the last one left, it brings a lot of clarity about what's important, what's meaningful. And I feel a little bad for Bruce because he's been doing great at what he does. He's the, he's the top of his game still. Uh, whether you like his music or not, I, I was in a group with 20 or 30,000 people that knew all the words to his songs. <laughs> and they're all saying they like Bruce. You know what I'm saying? You know, so we're not going there. That's not what I'm talking about. But he talked about, he says, I'm gonna, people that have died, they're going to live forever in my heart. They're going to live forever in my memory. And I found that very sad because that's not where we live forever. We will live forever with Jesus Christ in heaven, or we won't. We'll be in hell. We'll be lost. And I want to make sure we make the right choices. So I want to make sure that we have clarity as we look forward to our lives, what's still left, what's still coming for us. Let's make sure we're making good choices, picking the right things. Again, no judgment, no hate, nothing about it. Had a great time at the show, but it just kind of made me, made me think, let's keep pressing on, let's not quit. He wasn't doing it for worldly acclaim. Let's us not do it because we believe in Jesus. You can do stuff because you're famous and popular and maybe making a lot of money or whatever, although that never came across, but let's do this for Jesus. Let's keep on pressing on, let's not quit. What, what, when you see the members of your band, when you see people around you passing away, what's really important, what's really, what really matters? What really matters is you taking your kids with you to heaven and having eternal life. Amen? Isn't that the most important thing? So let's not waste it. Let's not spoil it on something else. So, um, again, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, but let's think about it. You know, I've thought about uh, Stephen Burkholder shared last week. His, his father was a fellow I knew, knew pretty well. He was part of this church for a while. Uh, passed away just a little over a year ago. You know, these are people in my age group. Leon, mentor and, and bishop for our, our congregation. Audrey's dad passed away just a couple months back, did the service right here. So I'm seeing people that, that are around me that have been important in my life pass it on. I want to make sure I've got clarity and vision for what's coming next. And I want you to have that too. I want you to have that too because we don't live forever. Plenty of people have been way younger than that, already going to, to be wherever they've gone. I want to make sure your life is with Christ. My life is hid with Christ and God, amen? Let's do that. Second guy. So the first guy is David. I just want you to know God calls you, chooses you. Don't give up on your destiny or your vision. I don't want you doing a farewell tour. I don't want you saying, I'm retiring now. I'm sitting back. I want you to keep on pressing on until we go see Jesus face to face. Cool? Is that clear? Okay. I might say it again anyway. I want to show you the second guy. It's, uh, he's in 1 Samuel chapter 26. This is the king that's been creating all the issues for David, and it's his own fault because he did stupid stuff and he didn't do what God told him to do, and he wouldn't repent. If we would just turn around from the dumb stuff we do, we could do better, you know that? And this isn't hard. It's challenging, but it's, it's not, not complicated. I like this. These, these next three are going to be fairly fast. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 21. 
Saul is still in the process of pursuing David now. He hasn't, he's going to, by the end of this, by the end of this chapter, by the end of this book, he's going to be dead. Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. It's not usually a verse I'd have you repeat, but why don't you say that with me? Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Surely I've, I played the fool. Surely I've been really stupid. And some of us are like that. Guys, when we've been really stupid, come on, church folk, what do we do when we've done stuff really stupid? Repent. What does that mean? Turn around. Let's go the other direction. Let's stop it. Let's, let's just go the right way. Get up from where you are, and let's get on with life. Okay? Don't, I, I was going to do a little, I probably ought to still do it. Let Danny and, and Doug race around the church. You're going to go forward, and he goes backwards. Um. And it isn't really a race, but I just want you to know it's way easier to run when you're looking the way that you're going. It's a lot slower when you're looking behind you, trying to run, especially if you're going to we do an obstacle course or something like that. It's, it's hard to, to run fast if you're looking backwards. And that's, uh, this is, again, it's not a physical challenge. Just think about it. Keep your eyes on what's ahead. If you keep looking at the past, you're going to keep messing up. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. Let's keep our eyes on what's ahead. That's what Paul said. I, I forget what's behind. I press on toward what's ahead. I fix my eyes firmly on what's ahead, pressing on to the fullness, that, uh, the high calling of Jesus Christ. Let's keep doing that until we're with him. Clear? Clear. Okay. I played the fool. Uh, he was jealous. He was a guy that tried to protect what he had. Uh, he, was, he had a life that was, we'll call it, all about Saul. Have you known people like that? They're just all about them. Everything about them is about them, you know? Oh, that's enough talking about me. Tell, tell me what you think about me. You know, that kind of thing. Just whatever it is, it's about them. That's what Saul was. He was jealous. He was jealous of David. I want us to be at like another, another level. Because uh, when you're done with that, you know what you're going to say? I was a fool. How many want to say I was a fool at the end of your life? You don't want to say that. I think everybody else did. It was really quiet. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Third guy. First guy is David. Second guy's Saul. I messed up. I was all about me. I lost my life. I, I messed it up. And again, he's going to die. Third guy is this. It's in Joshua chapter 14. This is a fellow named Caleb. And I can't read all the backstory about him, but um, if you're not familiar with him, check out Caleb in the Bible. He was one of Moses was commanded to take the Israelites into the promised land. They were, they were commanded, we're going to cross the Jordan, you're going to take the promised land. Joshua was one of the spies. Caleb was one of the spies. There were 10 other spies. 12 of these guys went in, spent 40 days spying out the land, and they're the ones that came back after looking at the land that God had said, I'm going to give it to you. You go up and take that land, take that promise. That's for you. I'm giving that to you guys. They went up, and they came back. Oh, man, the, the people are huge. There's giants. That's why you've got to be a giant killer. There's the walled cities. They, they're too much for us. Uh, the land is fruitful. So look at the grapes. It says they, they had a, a bunch of grapes, and it was so big, two of them carried it on a pole between them. I mean, that's a lot of grapes. When I get grapes, they come like this out of the supermarket. You know what I mean? It's like little bitty grapes. You know, even it's a big, it's, I wouldn't put on a pole. I'd be embarrassed. You know, two, can you help me? Hey, Brad, can you help me carry the grapes? You know, it's like, I got it. <laughs> just, just saying, you know. Uh, and they didn't go in. And they wound, it up, they wound up wandering in the wilderness 40 years. They lost 40 years of their destiny because they didn't do what God told them to do. 40 years later now, the only two spies of those original 12 that are left are Joshua and Caleb. So now, Caleb is now 85 years old. What might you think if you were Caleb? You missed your chance going into the promised land. Now you're 85, and, and now, now we're going into the promised land. How might you feel? Talk to me. Come on. You, old, yeah, right? What else? Ashamed, yeah. What else? Annoyed with everybody else? Yeah, annoyed with everybody else, right? Frustrated, like maybe I missed my chance, missed my destiny. All right, let's see what the Bible says. Joshua chapter 14, verse 7. This is Caleb talking. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. He said, let's go in. We can certainly take it. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And I like that because he's been wandering now 40 years because of the stupid decisions those other 10 guys made. That's, that, that's, that could affect your attitude, couldn't it? 
Yeah. I follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. All our heart. That's what we're doing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, right? That's it. First start. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country the Lord promised me that day. I think the Lord loves it when we get Caleb's, Caleb men, Caleb women that are saying, I. I'm still vigorous. I got time. I got time ahead of me. My life is still ahead of me. When you're 85, some, well, I'm going to retire. I'm going to get a, a, a rocker and sit on the chair and eat New Jersey gummies, you know, just, just you know, <laughs> if you get that. Sorry. <laughs> Legal there now, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to do that and hang out, and, you know, until the Lord comes back or I die. Joshua says, I'm still eager to go to battle. I'm going to take this land. I'm going to inherit the promises God has got for me. I want you and I to be people that, that press on to know the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. I know this is a basic message for a lot of us, but I like to hear it again to my own self. You could feel like you missed your chance. Maybe you feel like you missed your opportunity. Maybe you feel like life is never going to be all it could have been. Oh, it could have been, it could have been really something. But that's what he says. I am still ready to go. I've not given up. I want the hill country. I want Hebron. The Lord helping me, I'm going to defeat the giants. One little thing you ought to know about Hebron, the town that he wanted, there were three giants living there. Okay? Amen, Talmai, Ashak, something like that. I forget the, forget the names, but <laughs> three giants in the land. Says, I'm not worried about the giants. Lord help me, we're going to defeat them. Last guy, keep on pressing on. Let's not give up. The Lord helping us, we're going to defeat those giants. David did it. Caleb did it. You and I can do it too. Very end of the book of Joshua. Interesting, these are all Old Testament characters, but... Um, a lot of the stories we get, the life stories that we can learn from are back here. That's why the Bible says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. It's, it, it isn't just Old Testament stuff. It's, 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 it's for us today to, to, to see what they did. How do we do it? Last guy, Joshua. This is the fourth guy. David, uh, Saul, Caleb, and this guy, Joshua. Joshua 24, verse 14. They've taken a lot of the land. They've still got a little ways to go, but they've been working through this thing through the book of Joshua. And in verse 14, the Bible says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But, this is your pick, listen to this. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, if you don't want to do it, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. This is a choice God gives us. Uh, uh, somebody actually told me, well, God's pro-choice. He gives people choice. Yeah, and if you knew some of the stupid choices we made, you'd just assume he didn't give you the stupid choice. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, we have free will. Yes, you can pick stuff. But God's choice is that we would choose him. Let's choose right. Okay. Uh, choose for yourselves who you're going to serve. Choose for yourselves whom you're going to serve. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, back in 15, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the choice that you and I get today. I'm saying, brothers, sisters, choose life. Choose the Lord. Say, I'm going to be that guy. As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. My kids are going to serve the Lord. My grandkids are going to serve the Lord. As for me and my household, as far as it lies with me, we will serve the Lord. Four guys and Bruce. Bruce is still keeping on, but going the wrong direction. The other guy, one guy's dead, went the wrong direction. We got three that made it, and the one thing that they all had in common, they all kept their eyes on God. They all persevered. None of them gave up. None of them said, my life's over. None of them said, somebody else messed it up for me. None of them said, it's, it's too late now. All of them said, my, my whole future is ahead of me. My whole future is ahead of me. Let's stand together for prayer. including babies yet to come. <laughs> Future's here, almost. <laughs> the 
Let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word to us today. I thank you, God, you got a plan and a purpose for me, for my brothers, for my sisters, for each one of us here today. I thank you, God, you got a plan. Say this with me. Dear Lord, I thank you. You have a plan. You have a plan for me. Help me to keep on, keep on on until I see you face to face. I want to be like Caleb and say I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep walking with you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Amen.